Thank you very much. Good. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I'm delighted to come here on your 100th celebration, and I'm delighted to see uh, the kind of growth and, um, and recruitment that is going on. It's certainly an extremely important area. Uh, this country has been a bit short-sighted, along with the rest of the European Union, in terms of uh, food sustainability and local production and delivery of food. And I think we're part of a great new movement which will produce a very prestigious uh, new birth for food production. And uh, it's great to see so many young faces in the audience uh, who will carry that, uh, that forward. So I'm going to talk about uh, aphids as uh, our main uh, pest of arable agriculture. Originally, the remit was really to try and reduce or rationalise more the conventional control of aphids using aphicides, particularly systemic ones, uh, but now of course we have this overriding imperative to produce food more sustainably and that means removing uh, seasonal inputs. And of course I don't need to say that here, coming to the home of, <coughs> of perennial crops. That's the life cycle of the aphid and the, throughout the process of it moving between its summer host <coughs> and the winter host, it uses a whole series of semiochemicals. It uses sex pheromones for mating, it uses alarm pheromones to try and avoid predation and parasitism, but that can be turned in on itself and give the um, aphid uh, a, a, a sort of cue for it being located. And then it interacts with the summer host and the winter host. And as you'll see, emerging in my talk will be various hypotheses that we've tested and have valuable results from doing so. Uh, and one is that the winter host, although attractive in the autumn, is repellent in the spring as the summer host becomes attractive and the reverse also of that in the autumn. And that's a whole set of tools then with which we can manage aphid behaviour. Now to capture those, we obviously don't want to cause injury to the plant or to the aphid other than that that we uh, are investigating. So having the aphids on an intact plant uh, create a positive pressure and take out the volatiles by absorption onto a polymer allows us access to the kind of chemistry that the parasites and predators use, that the aphid uses to find its hosts and that the aphid uses to attract mates, the sex pheromone. Uh, if we take a model aphid, Magura visii, the vetch aphid, and look at its third segment of the antenna, we can see these structures. They are the olfactory sensilla, trivially named the secondary rhinaria. And if we can get our electrodes into those, then we can record from the firing of the olfactory uh, nerve cell body, <coughs> and that allows us to record what the aphid is doing. That's the light microscope version of that. Then there's the tungsten electrode, uh, and that is able to record from uh, the, the, the nerves that are associated, in this case, with the secondary rhine area on the third segment. And if we join that to gas chromatography, then we have the, the ultimate tool uh, that you would need, that is separative uh, chromatography uh, from the entrained sample that I've just, sorry, just described, acquiring, uh, so we can see the chemistry, but we can get the aphid to tell us what it's interested in, either with the whole antenna or, as I've just been showing you, these single cell recordings. That's what the trace looks like. That's what the chemist sees. There's the solvent that we um, <coughs> took the volatiles from the porous polymer with, and this is then the recording electrode in the cell body region beneath that sensillum. And there's just two peaks, and if we follow those back, we can see what the peaks are, and then we can run the whole thing on the mass spec and find out what they are. And there you can see one of your old colleagues, Colin Campbell, because although <coughs> we weren't really thinking that the identification of the sex pheromone was going to be any more than a paper in, in nature um, because the mafia, as far as aphid behaviour is concerned, centred in, as it was then anyway, in Oxford University and Silwood Park Imperial College, were insistent that these chemicals were not long-range attractants in any way. They were just aphrodisiac pheromones. But Collins' contention was that having worked on the hop aphid, um, that in fact the hop aphid did use them for longer range oriented flight. 
and we had a memorable uh, drink up in a pub near here after which um, we decided that although the wind strength seemed to be too high to do any real field work it wasn't and the old aphids were obliging and that's this very very little furred on humily and of course the, the chemistry was very interesting because it had a different stereochemistry from all the other pest aphids that were making these compounds and in fact Colin showed clearly with other colleagues here Mike Solomon and so on over the years that <coughs> that was potentially valuable <clears throat> now the there are two cells in fact in the in the uh, in the measurement by the insect of these chemicals one for the lactone and one for the lactol and uh, you can do dose responses on them even on these very little animals <clears throat> We're part of the Aphid Genomics Consortium. In fact, Lynn Field is a, um, a key annotator. She's the, uh, now head of department, uh, uh, replacing me when I retired from administration a couple of years ago. And uh, we are using the Aphid Genomics uh, opportunity to look at the biosynthesis of these chemicals in the P. aphid, which is the, the subject of the full genomic sequence. And there are the two cells, and they're always sorted so that you get a low amplitude cell responding to the lactone and a high amplitude cell to the lactol. It's only this isom, a one of eight, one of four, that gives that response. And only when the two cells fire do you get this wonderful behavior in the case of Forodon humili that demonstrated for the first time you could attract uh, these insects over a reasonable distance and at a reasonably opposing wind speed. But it's really the role of these pheromones as chiromones in attracting um, parasitic wasps and predators that we've done most of the work. Uh, with Wilf Powell at the practical level, uh, <clears throat> with people here, and with Jim Hardy at Silwood Park. And so it is possible to actually attract the parasites into the field earlier. Um, but at the moment, the world is very happy with the neonicotinoids and now the spirotetramic acids. Uh, and, and so we have to wait for a while before we can really launch that in a big way in practical agriculture. But we've already got to grips with producing the, um, uh, the, the pheromone uh, with spare capacity from paddock wood and, uh, and hop growing. We were able to start growing the Nepeta cataria as an arable crop harvested with a cyclone harvester wet into this tub and then steam distilling out this particular compound, one of the pheromone components for most aphids, uh, the lactone, which we could then elaborate with some very neat chemistry into another set of compounds which relates to the sex pheromone um, but is another chiromonal effect in that these are attractants for the lace wings. We even managed to pull out of the Buckinghamshire countryside uh, a, a lace wing that we didn't know we had at the early stages of this work. So Perimophina gracilis was not known to be in our fauna. It's presumably here through climate change, but with these powerful attractants, we could then see it. Um, but uh, the idea of using these uh, chemicals to make better use of lace wings, which are sold commercially in parts of the world, particularly in Korea, although this is a, a Chinese stamp, uh, there are small commercial enterprises there and in California using that chemistry. Not patented. We didn't patent it because we foolishly believed the guys at Oxford and Silwood at the time. We should have believed Colin and put a patent on it. Um, now, besides the pheromones, there is host location. And if you start to get to grips with host location, you also get to grips with when insects avoid unsuitable hosts. And obviously, to make your crop like an unsuitable host is a strategy for pest management. And there are two main hypotheses as to how animals locate plant hosts. And I'm going to look at the first one, which is this ratio-specific idea. So um, if you string out the volatiles of, uh, of the bean that is the host for the black bean aphid, you get a number of electrophysiologically active peaks. You'll notice that typical with these kind of experiments, there are some quite big peaks that give no electrophysiological response at all. It's a bit like your appreciation of food. Probably the most sophisticated um, food we have got in contact with at the moment is coffee, and yet it's just really one compound that gives us that classic smell. And it's like this for the insects, but maybe not just one compound, uh, it's 14 or 15 compounds here. And when you put them together, uh, Ben Webster is the PhD student on this project, you can actually get a sample 
there's the synthetic blend of those 14 compounds and it's just as good statistically as the bean volatiles. So the insect can't tell the difference in a behavioral bioassay. But those compounds individually aren't actually attractive except for that one Z3 hexene one ol and that compared with the whole mixture is nowhere uh, to be seen in terms of its activity. <coughs> I picked out another related compound there, E2 hexene al, also not attractive on its own. And Ben, very conscientious PhD student, uh, he did dose responses for all the compounds, enormous amount of work, and he was surprised to find that each of the compounds which contributed to this um, attractive mixture was actually repellent at some concentration. A bit like having too much Chanel number no. 5 on or too much aftershave just to not be too gender biased here. And, uh, and so he thought, well, all I've got to do now is put together all these compounds at their repellent dose and then I'm going to have a super repellent. But he admitted that he was wrong and indeed we all agreed with him that the <laughs> hypothesis was right because when you put them all together they are back to attractiveness and that's the subtle thing about these mixtures. When you get the context right, you get the mixture right, the insect can really use it as a very, very important cue. But of course that means that if you start to mess around with the composition then you can actually knock out this detection. Again, it's based on single olfactory neurons, and if you go further down the antenna, uh, further up the antenna rather, to the fifth segment and the sixth segment, then you can find these larger uh, structures which have a lot more olfactory neurons associated with them. And there's one for one of those compounds that I picked out there. And you can see these other leafy compounds are not giving a response, even at very high uh, concentrations relative to the original one. And this flies in the face of many of the textbooks which still talk about generalist receptors, but we're, we're, we're finding that we're, we're winning the argument. Uh, really, if you have a receptor that you've got some kind of general response with, then it's usually that you, because you don't know the specific compound. Um, just to depart from aphids for a short time into a, a dipteran pest, the orange wheat blossomage um, uh, Moselliana, Cytodoplosis Moselliana, has it, always been around, but it's not been a big pest. We predicted it would be, uh, and various colleagues in ADAS as well, to DEFRA, but they were having none of it. But suddenly it appeared, and the only thing you could use against it was the dastardly chlorpyrifos. And so to reduce chlorpyrifos, we helped develop with ADAS and the industry a decision support system. But again, it was based on knowledge of the pheromone and uh, we were able to synthesize the pheromone pure, sorry, pure and rather cheaply with some novel chemistry. So all this is underpinned by, 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 by top science in other disciplines, including particularly chemistry, which is my own uh, subject. And that allowed us then to work with the breeders to look at existing resistant lines, trying to use them more sparingly, they're not such good yielders, they're not really quite the quality of wheat that we want, but you've got to put them in there if you've got orange wheat blossomage to reduce the dependence upon chlorpyrifos. But now going back to the mixture, here's the mixture that the insect recognizes from wheat flour, uh, to, wheat flowers that is, to come in and oviposit, and this compound which we picked out because we have access to this compound genetically. We know how it's biosynthesized, the genes that are involved. If you just raise the level, not even by an order of magnitude, just a little bit, it messes up the recognition so that at least in the bioassay you see uh, now a, a mild repul repulsion, but certainly the elimination of the attraction. And of course, we're, we're working on that as a potential GM target. Now, the other hypothesis for species recognition is specific compounds and I work long and hard with people here uh, on Forodon humally because it is very host specific just into the uh, cannabinaceae that includes cannabis and, and humulus of course and nowhere else but in spite of the specific <coughs> chemistry of both of those genera it doesn't seem to use any of the specific chemistry. And so on this issue, we had to leave um, this pest of one of my favorite plants in the sense that uh, hops goes into beer. 
um, and move to the, the, the old chestnut of the crucifer recognition of Brevocarini brassicae and another aphid, uh, Lipaphius arismi. And you can see in the dose response here to single olfactory neurons in one of the, uh, in the fifth segment primary rhinarium that you saw a picture of, this very strong response to 4-pentenal and 3-butenal isothiocyanates, the catabolites of the glucosinolates, which are very classically present in the Brassicaceae and in other um, members of the, we used to call it the Caporales of the Brassicales now. Um, but interestingly, we found that um, in Aphis fabi, which never goes on to uh, crucifers, the same acuity. Fewer cells, more difficult to find, admittedly, but nonetheless there. And of course, the Aphis fabi uses that then to keep away from the plant that the adapted insects um, have uh, as, their, as their host. And in fact, with Jim Hardy, we quickly showed that if you have beans only in the olfactometer, 